Good morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Lizzie Burden in London, and these are the stories that set your agenda. Asian stocks edge higher as focus turns to tomorrow's key U.S. inflation data. Treasury steady after the 10-year yield hits the highest since November, a whisker away from 4.5%. Cuts coming. Former St. Louis Fed President James Bullard tells us markets should expect three cuts this year, but says the Fed doesn't need to rush. We'll bring you more of our exclusive interview this hour. Plus, Israeli officials signal fresh optimism on ceasefire talks with Hamas. But Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warns a date has been set for the invasion of the southern Gaza city of Rafa. Well, good morning. Welcome to Tuesday. And the prospect of three Fed cuts this year, whatever James Bullard says, is not looking as likely in the eyes of markets. Ahead of tomorrow's CPI reports, traders are fully pricing only two cuts, the first now seen in September. And with fewer cuts on the cards, it puts pressure on the upcoming earnings season to drive this stock market rally. Speaking of which, not a lot of fireworks on equities yesterday. You've got futures pointing to a slightly higher rate opening this morning on Wall Street, but not so here in Europe. And if we flip the board over to the cross-asset picture, let me show you what's been happening in Treasuries, because this is really where the action was. You had 10-year yields hitting their highest levels since November, within, as I say, a whisker of that crucial 4.5% level, and we'll bring you more on that in a moment. But currently, they're at a 4.4% level. The dollar little change, euro-dollar at a 108 handle as we await that ECB decision in Frankfurt. Now you're looking at the path ahead because June looks really like a done deal in terms of when the cuts start. So the focus on how much the ECB diverges from the Fed. And just finally, a look at Brent. Over $90 a barrel again here as the geopolitics dominate. And we'll get into the latest on those ceasefire talks shortly. But if we just analyze what's happening in these markets, they're looking ahead to inflation data out of the U.S. With traders' conviction on those three quarter point rate cuts from the Fed this year quickly dissipating. We've heard from Fed officials, including Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari, saying that he expects price pressures to ease further. Meanwhile, you've had former St. Louis Fed President James Bullard saying he expects monetary authorities to stick to their cautious rate cut strategy this year. The labor market is not red hot the way it was a year ago or two years ago, which was just crazy hot, and they had to keep paying up to keep their workers in place, let alone trying to find new workers. So it's not that red hot, but it's still a tight labor market. They're still having to compete to find workers. You should probably take uh, the committee and the chair at face value. I think their best guess right now is still three cuts this year. and. Of course, uh, the data can go one way or another, but that's the base case. For more, let's bring in our MLive strategist, Garfield Reynolds. Garfield, if Neil Kashkari is right and there are no rate cuts this year, how much would that rock markets? Well, it would certainly rock the bond markets, uh, especially because you know, it would throw into doubt the, the not just the this year cut idea, but next year, as in the Fed has penciled in six rate cuts by the end of next year. If they're not cutting at all this year, does that mean we only get three over that, over that span? That's going to seriously affect where yields can be and there are going to be a lot of you know, investors whose positions get hurt. They're going to get forced out of those positions. So that's going to hurt the bond market. For the stock market, it's a more mixed picture because your know, equities have shown, especially with the strong optimism surrounding the AI phenomenon, that uh, they're not necessarily worried by higher bond yields, provided that they can be sure that companies are going to go on, on, go on doing just fine, you, you know, that the economy is strong, mm. that's why you're not getting rate cuts, and that companies can benefit. The concern would be that you would need to see, we've already had some very, very impressive upside surprises on the earnings front, you'd need to see that going on happening if yields back up further, valuations are already pretty high, so higher yields means valuations can't really go higher. 
you need you need the earnings part of the picture to come in or at least the earnings optimism to get stronger because Nvidia continues to shoot the lights out and so do my, so does most of the rest of the tech space. Okay, but of course Kashkari doesn't vote this year. So if we just focus in on today, how brave should we be for yields to go higher? Well, the skew is for yields to go higher, both because of the data outlook and, and also because of this you know, very strong uh, undercurrent from you know, the, the leaders at the, at the Fed that even in the face of strong data, they expect to cut rates three times. So they're, they're laying out a world where they're more relaxed about the potential for in inflation so the kind of the the, the 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 what that's telling you is growth is going to remain high they're willing to risk inflation going higher that's a recipe for higher yields especially at the long end here you know, we might get some outperformance from the short end if they do indeed cut as much as they have said they've cut but the long end looks like a dangerous place to be in a world where the Fed has stopped worrying so much about that final mile in the inflation fight. Yeah, the Fed just driving over those bumps in the road towards the rate cuts. And let's just also, Garfield, while I've got you, talk about Japan, because we've had some comments from the BOJ Governor Ueda on the path for inflation in the past half hour. And traders on tenterhooks, really, ahead of the CPI report from the US tomorrow. Is that what could push the yen through 152 and trigger yen intervention? It, it could do so. I, I think you could actually look at Ueda's comments today, which were your semi-annual report about where monetary policy is going. He underscored the potential that they could end up moving again sooner rather than later if the current positive trends uh, you continue. That's a signal to Japanese bond traders that yields there can go higher. They did move higher today, even after an initial move down following a strong auction. So that's to some extent the BOJ playing defense against a strong CPI by signaling they're willing to go tighter uh, you, you, even if the Fed is not going to go as loose as had been thought. That might help to restrain the yen. Uh, the threat of intervention at the very least is certainly going to need to be there as well. And if we do get a blowout uh, CPI figure for the US. It's hard to see how the yen doesn't at least go past 152 uh, for a while and might go much, much higher unless there is you know, some concrete moves from the Ministry of Finance in Japan. Maybe it's just lots of jawboning and uh, rate checking, as they, call, as they uh, refer to it, calling around to banks to check what their yen quotes are, or you know, ultimately intervention. It has to be on the table given where the yen is sitting going into this CPI report. OK, well, we're not there yet. 15188 is where we trade on the yen at the moment. M Live strategist Garfield Reynolds, we thank you for that update. And now let's zoom out to broader Asian markets. Ishika Mukherjee in Singapore is on standby for us. Ishika, what's happening where you are? Hey, so TSMC is the biggest story in uh, Asian stock markets today. Uh, the world's biggest chip maker saw its shares rise more than 4% uh, to the highest on record yet again. Uh, it crossed the 800 new Taiwan dollar mark. Um, and that's because the chip makers got $11.6 billion uh, in US loans and grants. It's going to build a third factory in Phoenix, Arizona. And that factory is going to focus on two nanometer chips uh, as President Joe Biden tries to reshore very critical technology and uh, TSMC has been on a tear re really and it's helping the TWSE index which is the TIEX index um, in Taiwan lead gains in Asia today. So the TIEX index rose uh, more than 1.8 percent actually um, and 75 percent of the gains came from TSMC and really that story for Taiwan for any foreign investor is TSMC. And uh, we've seen its market uh, cap gap with South Korea, which is another chip making play, um, widen to the most since 2003 because of the excitement around TSMC. 
Moving on, the other story today was Chinese stocks for us. Um, so the Hang Seng China Enterprises Index rose uh, more than 1.6% um, and helped by Chinese online gaming stocks. So China actually approved uh, 14 imported online games, including Mega Man 11 and Million Arthur. And that's pushed up stocks like NetEase, um, and it's pushed up Tencent, Perfect World. Some of these names distribute these titles in China. Um, flipping the board, uh, when we were looking at Japan, as you spoke to Garf just now, uh, so it's been helped by the exporters today, the Nikkei Index, the Topics Index, um, and the exporters, of course, are getting help from a weak yen. Uh, everyone's on watch for that 152 psychological level for yen intervention, as you said. Um, but we do have the likes of Stan Chart saying that, you know, Japanese authorities are not going to move uh, before the U.S. CPI report which brings me to the most important story, uh, which is the US CPI report. <laughs> so Asia stocks overall are actually gaining uh, ground today ahead of uh, the US CPI report out on Wednesday. All right, Ishii Kamukaji in Singapore, we thank you. And indeed, we are very excited for that US CPI report tomorrow. But we've got plenty more on the docket in the meantime today. At 9 a.m. UK time, we get the ECB's bank lending survey. Of course, you'll remember the chief economist at the ECB, Philip Lane, cited this survey in a speech last summer saying how much of a role it plays in the ECB's analysis. The expectation is that it's going to confirm lending conditions are not deteriorating as rapidly as last year. And that should give the governing council room to proceed, albeit cautiously, when they start lowering rates this year. As I say, the expectation is that they start in June. Then, at 6 p.m. London time, the U.S. Treasury is going to sell $58 billion of three-year notes. So we mind that auction. And then later on, we get the latest numbers for Airbus and Boeing deliveries. Of course, Boeing's been very much in the spotlight for all the wrong reasons lately. So its deliveries have been slipping further behind Airbus. Be interesting to see the gap. Look at that crocodile mouth widening there year to date. But you can get a roundup of the stories you need to know to get your day going in today's edition of Daybreak. They lead on the Bullard comments on Fed cuts this morning. Still three, says James Bullard. But they also have stories on Blackstone being near a deal to buy out L'Occitane, of course, the beauty skincare brand. Uh, and they have UBS to attain full ownership of its China platform by swapping its holding in credit. Suisse is onshore securities venture with a Beijing government investment fund. So you can get all of those stories by going to DAYB Go on your terminal. Coming up on the program, Israeli officials signal fresh optimism on ceasefire talks with Hamas. But far-right ministers threaten to bring down the government on those talks. We'll bring you the latest from the Middle East next. So stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Now, senior Israeli officials say progress has been made in negotiations for a ceasefire in Gaza that would include the release of hostages and Palestinian prisoners. It's a move that's drawn criticism from far-right ministers who've threatened to bring down the government. So to pass all this, we've got Bloomberg's Bruce Einhorn. Morning, Bruce. Just tell us what progress has been made in these ceasefire talks. Uh, well, Lizzie, what we, what we do know is that there have been comments from some senior Israeli officials that are the most upbeat when it comes to the prospects of a ceasefire in a long time. Uh, the defense minister, Yoav Gallant, said uh, uh, that progress in the war has allowed Israel to, quote, make difficult decisions to return the hostages. I think we are at an appropriate point. Also yesterday, there were comments from the foreign minister, Israel Katz. Uh, he said that I am more optimistic than I was when it comes to uh, the prospects of a ceasefire. This is a, a major change from as recently as last week when we were hearing comments that uh, Israel thought that there was still quite a gap between Israel and Hamas uh, about a possible ceasefire. Uh, uh, one thing to keep in mind is while we are hearing some uh, uh, optimistic comments from Israeli officials, uh, a senior official of Hamas tells Bloomberg that uh, there are no talks scheduled. 
uh, that uh, there is no imminent uh, ceasefire ahead. Uh, uh, there has been no progress in the talks. Uh, Hamas is recognized by the United States and by the EU as a terrorist organization. Lizzie. Yeah, and that denial from Hamas pushing up the oil price again. Meanwhile, it looks like a Rafah invasion is still going to go ahead, even though Israel's saying there's been this progress on ceasefire talks. Why? Oh, well, it's, it's still uncertain about uh, if and when there will be uh, an invasion of Rafah. Uh, there was a report from the Associated Press that uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu said that there is a date, that a date has been set for uh, an invasion. Uh, the prime minister is facing a lot of pressure from members of his government, in particular um, some of the far-right members uh, who very much uh, want uh, further escalation, further um, action in Rafah, uh, and have threatened to bring down the government uh, if there isn't one. Uh, for instance, uh, the National Security Minister, Itamar ben Gavir said that uh, if there is no uh, attack on Rafah, if, if there is no further action, that he said uh, the Prime Minister would not have a mandate to continue serving. Uh, so uh, if there isn't any further action, could jeopardize uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's government. He has a very slim majority, uh, and there's a lot of pressure that he's facing from others uh, within Israel. Uh, so uh, if, he, if he doesn't proceed with the invasion, then uh, his stay in office, uh, the, the length of it is definitely up for question. That said, he is okay, facing so a lot of pressure who? from the United States. The United States is pressuring Israel and Hamas. Um, Israeli officials say that uh, the Americans are putting more pressure on to get a ceasefire, to get more humanitarian assistance, to get the hostages released. Exactly. International and domestic pressure ramping up on Benjamin Netanyahu. Bruce Einhorn, we thank you for that update on the situation in Israel as it has held rates to protect the shekel as the war spending soars. Well, coming up, we're going to go to Africa. Ned Bank's outgoing CEO says that South Africa remains a destination for investment, irrespective of the outcome of next month's election. More from our interview with Mike Brown next. This is Bloomberg. We're still investing in China because we see that long-term potential. Transition is taking place. Now is the time to invest, in my view, in China to be part of that transition and the future growth. Investors, what I hear here, are looking for these growth companies in China that they've been hearing about, that they've been seeing. That's starting to stimulate secondary market growth. But we're actually underweight China at the moment. You know, the overhang of the real estate, um, going into consumer confidence, business confidence. We're starting to see net inflows. We're starting to see those policies coming through. HSBC executives there speaking exclusively to Bloomberg at the bank's Global Investment Summit in Hong Kong. And staying with banking, we go to Africa now. Ned Bank's outgoing CEO says South Africa remains a destination for investment, irrespective of the outcome of next month's election. For more on this story, joining me now is Bloomberg's Jennifer Zabasaja. Jen, what's the reasoning behind this? Lizzie, I mean, the big thing that Mike, uh, Mike Brown was telling us is largely that his base case is in line with a lot of polls, which suggests that the ANC, the ruling party, uh, is going to keep a majority or potentially form a coalition government, meaning a continuity uh, of policies. Uh, and this is very important if we take a look at the biggest issues facing this, con or this country. Excuse me. Take a listen to what he told us. Most analysts, they'd say that GDP growth for the next two to three years is somewhere between one and one and a half percent. But at the same time, most analysis says the energy problems costing us maybe three percent of GDP and the logistics problems probably also costing us three percent of GDP. So if we are able to resolve those through things like public-private partnerships, there's certainly a few percent of GDP growth extra. And South Africa growing at three or four percent 
is a very different economy than South Africa growing at one to one and a half percent. Do you do you actually see that continuing? Because also when you were, uh, you know, you've been a part of the business uh, leadership community here in South Africa. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen on May 29th with this election. Uh, but does the private sector still have the ability to, you know, s step in where they can, uh, given, you know, where the country, where the economy is at right now? Well, the, the initiative has been led by, by Martin Kingston for the, at the Beef USA platform. And, and I think many of the sort of hard yards are already showing results. So if you just take energy, for example, I think the key achievement uh, in these engagements has been effectively the deregulation of energy supply in South Africa and the ability for private sector companies to generate energy at scale. And, and many large projects are currently underway that will connect to the grid in 2024, 2025. So, so that runway is, all, is already open uh, as, the, as the way of solving the energy crisis in, in our country. And I, I don't think there are many alternatives to that. So I think things like that will continue irrespective of the outcome of elections. And Lizzie, uh, Mike there talking about uh, energy, of course, energy, one of the biggest issues facing uh, this economy and this country. Uh, in addition to that, there's also the transport issues, logistics issues, crime and corruption. And so Mike is a part uh, of this business leadership community that's really tried to help and step in as the private uh, public partnership uh, to get things on track. But his messaging is really important, especially if we think about him as the outgoing CEO of one of South Africa's biggest lenders. He's also been at the Helm uh, for more than 14 years. He came into the role uh, as the global financial crisis was happening. He's obviously exiting at, at a pretty precarious time uh, for this uh, economy. Uh, but this is important when we think about the context of where South Africa is right now. It's still on the gray list. And so that is, of course, affecting investor sentiment. It affected uh, foreign direct investment last year. Uh, and so his, uh, his perspective was really that, you know, despite what we do see on May 29th, even though we are really looking forward to those elections, uh, potentially this economy and this country is on track to solving the biggest issues, the biggest hindrances uh, to uh, any sort of growth uh, here uh, in South Africa. But yes, it was really great to get his perspective. He's been at Nedbank, as I mentioned, as CEO for 14 years, been at Nedbank, though, for most of his career. Uh, so he really has an interesting perspective on uh, not just the financial sector within this country, uh, but also the outlook uh, for the country more broadly. Yeah, an important interview. Excellent reporting. Bloomberg's Jennifer Sabasaja, who, of course, will be all across those elections in South Africa. We thank you. Lovely to see you, Jen, as always. Now, let's just get a quick check on commodities here, because we have been discussing the geopolitics there with Bruce Einhorn, and they have been rumbling the oil markets. Oil around a five-month high, not only on the geopolitics, also because of tighter supply and high demand, but the volatility of the past few days coming back to the situation in Israel. Gaza. Uh, as Bruce says, you've had progress on the ceasefire talks, says Israel, but Hamas denying that. So you've got Brent at $90.53 a barrel, WTI at $86.53. Gold still at a record high, up more than 17% since mid-February. Now, there isn't an exactly obvious trigger here, but again, you've got the heightened geopolitical risk, buying by central banks led by China, and traders, of course, bracing for that US CPI print tomorrow for the future path for Fed rates. Coming up on the programme, it's been the weakest first quarter for property deals in Germany since 2011. We'll get a live report from Berlin next. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Lizzie Verdon in London, and these are the stories that set your agenda. Asian stocks edge higher as focus turns to tomorrow's key U.S. inflation data. Treasury steady after the 10-year yield hits the highest since November, a whisker away from 4.5%. Cuts coming. Former St. Louis Fed President James Bullard says markets should expect three cuts this year, but adds the Fed doesn't need to rush. We'll bring you more of that exclusive interview this hour. 
Plus, Israeli officials signal fresh optimism on ceasefire talks with Hamas. However, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warns a date has been set for the invasion of the southern Gaza city of Rafah. Well, good morning. Welcome to Tuesday. And it looks like Fed cuts, three of them this year. The prospect of that rapidly dissipating. Despite what James Bullard says, you've had traders pairing back their bets on cuts. Now they see only two fully priced and the first not starting till September. So you have seen the impact of that through the markets as traders await the CPI report out of the US tomorrow. Of course, it puts pressure on the earnings season to drive this stock market rally. And speaking of which, you've got futures pointing to a slightly higher opening stateside there, but looking for a lower opening here in Europe. And if we flip the board over to the cross asset picture, you can see the action in treasuries. 4.4% is where we are on the 10 year yield. They did hit their highest levels since November off the uh, latest Fed speak, off the latest data out of the US. And we're going to have more on a moment on why that 4.5% level is so crucial. But the dollar little changed. Euro dollar still at a 108 handle as we look towards the ECB meeting in Frankfurt. The question really how much divergence there'll be between the Fed and ECB paths. And finally, Brent, $90.57 with all of that geopolitics happening in the background. Are ceasefire talks actually progressing? Israel says yes. Hamas says no. But now let's zoom out on Asia markets. We've got Ishika Mukherjee on standby for us in Singapore with the latest. What's happening where you are, Ishika? Hey, Lizzie, I'm going to begin with the granular stuff. So we have TSMC on our monitors today. Uh, the world's biggest chip maker, so, uh, chip maker sorry, saw so its shares rise 4.6%. Um, it's got great news, 11.6 billion in grants and loans from the US uh, to open a third facility, a third factory in Phoenix, Arizona, where it's going to be producing two nanometer chip technology and all this as President Joe Biden tries to uh, reshore and have critical technology being built um, uh, on, in the US itself without having to import from China. Um, and that's helping drive up the Taiwan index. Uh, TSMC accounted for about 75% of the gains in the uh, TIEX index, which is Taiwan's stock benchmark. Um, it's led gains in Asia today up about 2%. Um, and to a fresh record high. TSMC itself is also climbing to a fresh record high, and it crossed that 800 new Taiwan dollars uh, mark for the first time. Um, the other part of the market that was interesting is China stocks. So the Hang Seng China Enterprises Index rose as much as 1.7% before pairing gains. Traders are happy that there aren't any very serious and worrisome headlines from Yellen's trip. And uh, the index is also getting a boost from online gaming stocks after China approved 14 uh, imported online games. And that's pushing up the likes of NetEase and Tencent, uh, which helps distribute one of the games called Mega Man 11 um, and actually Million Arthur as well onshore in China. Um, moving on to Japan, we saw exporters uh, helping gains there. As the yen remains weak, we're watching that 152 level for the yen. Um, it's expected to be the level at which uh, Japanese authorities could intervene, as we've discussed uh, before. And uh, you have the likes of Stan Chart saying that, you know, traders are going to hold on, Jap Japanese authorities are going to hold on um, before intervening. Uh, ahead of the US CPI data, because if that comes in hotter than expected, uh, pushes up the dollar, we see what happens to the yen then. So that's on watch. And over to Korea, we have the COSP index lower ahead of uh, parliamentary elections on Wednesday. The market's closed tomorrow. So traders are positioning ahead of that. Um, and they'll see if the current president can win a majority in that market. So Asia overall is up. Um, ahead of that, those CPI numbers um, on Wednesday. Uh, let's see how they trade tomorrow, right before we get into that key data that's going to be live. 
Okay, Ishika Mukherjee in Singapore, we thank you. And I'm glad that you've brought up Japan because we have been listening to Governor Ueda of the BOJ speaking in Parliament. Uh, key lines coming from the BOJ. He says he doesn't think negative rates are going to be needed for the time being. The price trend is still below 2%, but it's vital to support the economy with monetary policy, he says. They're going to check wage growth in the hard data after the spring talks. They may slow the unwinding of easing if the shock hits the economy but they may speed up reducing easing if the positive cycle is stronger they say there's a downside risk of the big price deviations uh, that's got lower but monetary policy fundamentally says Ueda is not meant to control FX rates so Governor Ueda speaking in Parliament there we're listening to those key lines for you out of Tokyo as we watch the yen currently at a 15189 handle uh, the level that we watch for though as Ashika says is 152 uh, for a potential yen intervention and of course as Ashika says that US CPI report and its impact on the dollar crucial of course, to the yen story. But now, to some other stories making news this morning. The embattled French IT company Atos is seeking 1.2 billion euros in new funds and aiming to cut its debt by at least half. In a restructuring plan presented to creditors, Bloomberg understands Atos said it's seeking to convert about half of its borrowings into equity. Once hailed as the rising star of France's tech industry, Atos is struggling under a wall of debt with 3.65 billion euros due by the end of next year. Elsewhere, Tesla CEO Elon Musk has shrugged off a drawn-out labour dispute in Sweden. The conflict with unions over the carmaker's refusal to sign a collective bargaining agreement has been going on since October. And since the initial walkout, more than a dozen unions in Sweden and other Nordic countries have blocked Tesla-related work. And that includes mail collection and delivery, trash pickups and handling Teslas at ports. Musk posted online that, quote, the storm has passed on that front. And Germany is said to be forging ahead with a sweeping overhaul of its armed forces, with orders worth as much as 7 billion euros. Sources say the ruling coalition wants to order hundreds of armoured transport vehicles and two additional Navy frigates. It's part of Germany's push to modernise its military following Russia's Ukraine invasion, but it still requires approval from lawmakers. Well, we'll get more into the military story later in the programme, but just sticking with the property sector and deals in Germany, they've had the worst first quarter since 2011. Real estate advisor Jones Lang LaSalle says deals for offices and residential buildings and warehouses as well dropped 19% compared to a year ago. Well, for more, we've got Bloomberg's Oliver Crook with us from Berlin. Oli, another dark spot in the German economy here. Just how bad are things in the German property sector? Yeah, Lizzie, I'm afraid I'm just always the sort of doom and gloom report here from Germany, and I'm afraid, you know, commercial real estate is no exception from that. As you're saying, I mean, let's look at the volume transactions of uh, transactions down 19%, as you mentioned, that's the lowest since uh, 2011, and this is for commercial property. And where is that mostly concentrated? When you look at big deals, they're trying to off offload big portfolios. That figure is even higher. We're talking about a 50% decline in terms of those kinds of moves over that period of time. And, you know, it's obviously bearing out also, guess what, in prices. And we look at office space. I mean, this is not an exception here in Germany. It's around the world. Office space is a kind of a major story. But prices fell 10% last year, which maybe doesn't sound that huge when you're thinking about what this market is dealing with, high interest rates, a gloomy economy. Um, but really, 10% was the largest decline in office space prices on record in Germany since they started collecting the data back in 2003. And as we know, this is about interest rates. Yes, it's about a sort of slowdown here in Germany. But there's another factor here that even if the economy picks up, doesn't go away. And that's work from home. And according to the IFO Institute that does sort of all of these sort of economic surveys across Germany, they see that there's going to be a loss of demand for office space in Germany by 12% by 2030. So that means that no matter really what happens, there's a demand question in the next five or six years that will decrease by 12%, which is not going to go away. Yeah, ever since you've been in Germany, Ollie, things have been a bit bleak there. Is that causation or correlation, I have to wonder? But bank loan books really are a concern. So when does this become a conversation at the ECB, who, of course, meet later this week? 
Yeah, that's right, Lizzie. So I think it's already a conversation at the ECB. We hear from it, but you know, you have to think about their kind of key to all of this, right? They obviously are key as the setter of interest rates. This is a key question for them because if you have massive issues in the real estate sector, it will bear on financial stability, you know, their, or, or, or I should say price stability, their one mandate. And then of course, the third is they're the supervisor to the banks that hold a huge amount of these loans. How many of these loans do they hold? Um, for Euro area banks, they have 1.2 trillion euros of credit with commercial real estate as collateral. That is more than 8% of the loan book across the board, and that is mostly co uh, concentrated in Germany and in France. And what's interesting is in Germany, you don't get the pricing, you don't get updated um, appraisals of these buildings like you do in the UK and the US. So in a swiftly moving downside market, you don't really have as clear an idea of what's going on. So that's a concern, obviously, for investors. It's a concern for the ECB. We understand that senior ECB officials are looking at different ways in which they can kind of um, add more measures in order for banks to sort of boost um, their resilience to what's going on in the market right now, maybe further provisions, maybe changing sort of the collateral relative to the loans value. And we saw it really play out with Julius Baer, right, where 40% of their private loan book was to Cigna, which completely collapsed, and that was a huge exposure, but they're a strong institution. It's the smaller players in Germany. We saw um, one of the banks, Deutsche Fondbank, Brief, uh, Brief Bank, which was one of them that got absolutely decimated. It's bounced off the bottom there, but again, the concern for these smaller institutions. You talk to Deutsche Bank, they say, yeah, there are some dark spots in some of the loan book before them, but it is not structural. It's the smaller players that people are really concerned about. Crucial context, Dolly Crook out of Berlin, we thank you for that update. Now let's stay with property. Stocks of apartment landlords have risen and seen the busiest rally in nearly four months. This is after Blackstone stepped up its bet on the industry. The world's largest commercial real estate owner announced plans to acquire apartment income REITs for roughly $10 billion. Meanwhile, European defence companies have been making a flying start to the year themselves, making up three of the top four performers on Europe's stocks 600. Rheinmetall, Kongsberg and Saab have benefited from a boost in expenditure across the continent following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Now, that spending could rise. You've had NATO officials saying that EU nations will need to raise their defence budgets to meet that renewed threat from Moscow. And for more, I'm joined by Bargawi Chukti Whale from Bloomberg Economics. Lovely to have you, Bar Bargavi. What are the uh, proposals here? Is there actually the political appetite in Europe to ramp up a Cold War scale military industrial complex? Oh, thanks, Lizzie. Well, last year there was a world defense spending reached a record $2.2 trillion. And of late, in Europe, Russia's aggression in Ukraine has been a wake up call. And after years of limited defense spending following the Cold War, more and more European nations are stepping up and spending more. Um, around 20 out of NATO's 32 allies are expected to spend 2% of GDP on defense this year, and that's up from four the year before Russia's invasion. On the other side, we've got China's rising military might, which is gaining attention, and there's this looming threat of Beijing moving on Taiwan. So the short answer is, I think that, yes, there is a political appetite to ramp up um, more military spending. Okay, that's interesting, but what would it mean for debt markets? Well, um, we at Bloomberg Economics, we looked at two different scenarios of what could potentially happen. So in one in which we looked at the U.S. and its partners, if they spend at least 2% of GDP on defense, and then a much more extreme scenario mimicking Cold War levels in which they raise defense spending to 4%. For countries like Germany and Canada, with relatively low levels of forecasted debt and fiscal headroom, this higher spending, it's feasible, even though it might be painful. But for a lot of other governments, especially Japan, Italy, and France, they could struggle to increase defense spending substantially without doing more spending cuts or raising taxes or taking on more additional debt or some sort of combination. Uh, more specifically with numbers, France, Italy and Spain would be particularly exposed to the extra spending as funded by borrowing. Italy's public debt, which is already high at 144 percent this year, could go up to 179 percent by 2034. The U.S. is already at 3.3 percent of defense, but if they raise it to 4 percent, they could go up to 131 percent over the next decade from 99 percent this year. Overall, we calculated that G7 countries, it, the total number of additional commitments over the next decade could actually total higher than $10 trillion if defense spending were to rise to 4 percent. 
Okay, Bargui Shuk Tuil, really important context on the outlook for increased European defence spending, its impact on the debt markets and the political appetite as well. Well, thank you. That's the latest from Bloomberg Economics. And now for some other stories making news this morning. Bloomberg's learned that UBS is in discussions to attain full ownership of its China platform. Sources say it's proposing to buy the remaining 33% stake in UBS securities from Beijing state-owned assets management. And in return, it would sell part or all of its position in Credit Suisse Securities China to the Beijing government fund. Elsewhere, Bloomberg's learned that Blackstone is nearing a deal to take cosmetics company L'Occitane private. Sources say that the private equity firm may team up with the firm's billion uh, owner, Reinhold Geiger, for the buyout. So we'll keep across that potential deal. Always been a fan of the hand cream myself. Coming up, former Fed Lewis Fed President James Bullard expects three rate cuts this year. We'll bring you more of our exclusive interview from HSBC's Global Investment Summit in Hong Kong next. Next, stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Former St. Louis Fed President James Bullard says he's expecting three interest rate cuts this year as inflation moves towards the central bank's target. He's been speaking exclusively to Bloomberg's Herzlinda Amin from HSBC's Global Investment Summit in Hong Kong. I think at this point you should probably take uh, the committee and the chair at face value. I think their best guess right now is still three cuts this year. and. Of course, uh, the data can go one way or another, but that's the base case. Um, I think it's been a very successful policy. Uh, the policy rate was increased a lot during 2022, and inflation fell quite a bit in the second half of 2023. Last year at this time, core PC inflation would have been 200 basis points higher than it is right now. That's the committee's favorite measure. So you're looking at a very successful policy with a pretty strong economy. So a lot of things going right for the Fed right now. So Powell has been right so far? Yeah, I think he's been right so far and the committee's been right so far to pursue an aggressive strategy to bring inflation back to target. Uh, most of that was in 2022. And then you bore the fruit in 2023 and into 2024 here. Uh, we talk about how the Fed is data dependent. Powell himself says he is data dependent. What exactly does that mean and which data in particular is he looking at, should be looking at? Yeah, I think right now I think it's mostly the inflation data because on the real side of the economy, things are going very well. And you can argue about why, but they're going very well. The committee doesn't really have to worry about that side of the mandate right now. All they've got to worry about is getting inflation back to the 2% target. And they've come a long ways back already. Uh, it was 4.8%, now 2.8% uh, core PC inflation on a 12-month basis. That means you've only got eight-tenths of 1% to go. And uh, some people are saying that the next report will lead to core PC being only 2.6% on a 12-month basis. So you're starting to get close enough. I think you have enough data in hand right now to justify the first rate cut. Uh, maybe not a whole string of rate cuts, but you could certainly justify the first rate cut now based on the data that they have. We talk about how the U.S. economy is very strong. So would you say that the risk in uh, the U.S. economy right now is inflation and not growth? Fair to say that? That's, I think that's right, yeah. Why is the U.S. economy so resilient? I mean, not too long ago, we were expecting a recession, 100% or, you know, priced in yeah. of a recession. Yet here we are with a very resilient economy. Yeah, last year at this time, you had the uh, bank failure of Silicon Valley Bank and other banks, uh, smaller banks around the country, that was overinterpreted to mean that the U.S. was going into recession. I don't think it was ever a good story to tell because, yes, their, their, their banks failed, but they're only a small fragment of the total banking and the total intermediation sector in the U.S. economy. So I think uh, that card was overplayed. Um, and 
not only did the U.S. not go into recession in the second half of 2023, but the economy actually boomed in the second half of 2023. So you really got a very strong outcome, and that has continued into the first part of 2024 here. Although I would say we're, clo- we're going to be closer to the trend growth rate now, not, not way above trend the way we were uh, during the last six months of 2023. Former St. Louis Fed President James Bullard speaking there. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. My base case scenario is that inflation will continue to fall this year. And I jotted down in March that we would have two interest rate cuts, 25 basis points over the course of this year. So that was my base case scenario. Then I explained, if we don't see any progress on inflation and inflation moves sideways, then that would make me question, why would we cut interest rates? Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari speaking there. Disclaimer, he doesn't vote this year, but you are seeing an impact on markets from the latest data, from the latest Fed speak. Fewer Fed cuts being priced this year. Just take a look. Investors now seeing fewer than three cuts fully priced for the rest of 2024. And if you just take a look as well, 60 basis points of cuts roughly uh, for the rest of the year. So that's about two and a half cuts this year. Flip the board and you can see the comparison to the expectations for the ECB. Now it's looking like there are higher odds of an ECB cut in June than a Fed cut. So as we've been discussing throughout the programme, that should have an impact on the currency as well. But all eyes now on US CPI data out tomorrow. Could it change the game after that jobs data? It looks like you've got a shadow being cast over a June cut from the Fed. Speaking of which, a chilly midday darkness fell across North America yesterday as a total solar eclipse raced across the continent. It thrilled those lucky enough to see the spectacle through the clear skies and clouds blanketed most of Texas as the eclipse began its dash across the land, starting along Mexico's mostly clear Pacific coast and aiming for Texas and 14 other U.S. states before exiting into the North Atlantic near Newfoundland. It took just one hour, 40 minutes for the moon's shadow to race more than 4,000 miles across the continent. I must confess, I was asleep, but those images, absolutely stunning. I think you will agree. Up next, markets today. So stay with us. This is Bloomberg.